How many triangles can you see? One, two, three. three. <laughs> this is active learning with Dynamo. It's a new way for your kids to learn across television, books and the internet. Through words and number games, you and your kids can enjoy learning by doing Dynamo. Join in with Active Learning. The series starts Saturday morning at 3 on BBC Two. A warning from history on BBC Two in 10 minutes. Nazi order and discipline turns to chaos in the award-winning documentary. The news here on BBC One with Peter Sissons. The end of an era in Germany. Helmut Kohl is out after 16 years in power. The now former Chancellor has accepted responsibility for his party's defeat and is bowing out of national politics. Gerhard Schroeder, the Social Democrat leader, comes to power claiming victory for the new centre and a new generation. And here Tony Blair is urged to listen to Labour's grassroots after the left stages a conference comeback. Good evening. Europe's longest serving political leader, Helmut Kohl, has been defeated in Germany's landmark general election. The 68-year-old Chancellor had led his conservative Christian Democrats for 25 years and been in power for the last 16. The new Chancellor will be the Social Democrat leader, Gerhard Schroeder, who has hailed the election result as a generational change. The full results won't be known until tomorrow, but the final outcome is not in doubt. The latest projections give Helmut Kohl's CDU-CSU alliance under 35% of the vote and Gerhard Schroeder's SPD more than 41%. Although they'll be the biggest party in the new parliament, they'll need support from at least one other, possibly the Greens. Our World Affairs editor John Simpson reports from Bonn. Across Germany, the Kohl era came to a quiet end. No passion, no excitement, no great tension. After 16 years, it seemed to be time. In Koblenz and hundreds of places like it, there was none of the unexpected surge at the polling stations which won Helmut Kohl the last election four years ago. This time he said he wouldn't stay on if the result was a coalition with the left. And that's exactly what people have voted for, a coalition headed by the left. Tonight, as the first exit poll figures came in, there was shock and depression at the Christian Democrats' national headquarters in Bonn. People here had expected the result to be much closer. And when Helmut Kohl arrived to concede defeat, they were still in shock. He is the CDU. He's dominated the party for a quarter of a century. He took his defeat with dignity, but right up to the end, it doesn't seem to have occurred to him that he might lose. Obviously, he said, I take full responsibility for the defeat. There's no question about it. As for myself, I'm now resigning as party chairman with immediate effect. Over at the Social Democrats' headquarters, of course, they greeted their leader, Gerhard Schroeder, with sheer delight. Schroeder has won this election by a skillful appeal to the middle ground. But he's essentially a front man. The real power in the party is Oscar Lafontaine, standing close beside him, a traditional socialist. Immediately after his victory, Gerhard Schroeder spoke to the BBC. Germany's not going to become a different republic, he said. We won't change everything fundamentally, but we will do things better. Germany will remain a reliable partner to its allies, he went on, and it'll be more stable economically. Maybe our competitors should watch out. So we know Gerhard Schroeder is going to be the next chancellor, but we don't yet know who his coalition partners will be. Could be the Christian Democrats, without Helmut Kohl, of course. Schroeder would prefer to go in with the Greens, but between them they may not have quite enough seats and he refuses to depend on the reformed East German Communist Party. We'll probably know all this by tomorrow. What we know tonight is that the Helmut Kohl era is finally at an end. John Simpson, BBC News, Bonn. Tonight's defeat for Chancellor Kohl brings to an end a political career that lasted more than 40 years. Our Europe correspondent William Horsley looks back over the Kohl era. Hey, 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 
German reunification was a personal triumph for Helmut Kohl. As this decade dawned, Kohl's place in history was already safe. But love of power undid him in the end. In the spring carnival, the jesters crowned him king of fools, a foretaste of reality. From Rhineland boss of the Christian Democrats, he rose to leader of the opposition and in 1982 replaced Helmut Schmidt as Chancellor of West Germany. When he started out, we saw him as a provincial man from Rhineland without great ideas. What we underestimated, and everybody underestimated, that behind the bureaucrat there was a visionary. And he never actually wanted to know what his visions would cost. The collapse of communism when it came left others dazed. But Kohl took charge, promising a better life cost-free for Germans in one fatherland. At the unification party in Berlin, he took on the aura of a father of the nation. But soon, East Germans sensed Kohl's promises of flourishing landscapes were a sham. Their weak industries collapsed. Millions were thrown out of work. Now the Chancellor felt the people's anger turn on him. Kohl's other big idea, uniting Europe, drove him to a close embrace with President Mitterrand of France. With other European leaders, he forged a European Union to take the place of rival nation-states. Kohl sacrificed the Deutschmark to realize this dream. Against the will of his own countrymen, he made sure the Euro currency will be born. Now he's paid the price, quitting the stage not in his own time to bask in his great achievements, but only when the nation decided it was time for him to go. William Horsley, BBC News, Berlin. Gerhard Schroeder has been portrayed by his supporters as the Tony Blair of German politics. He said he wanted Germany to be more modern and socially just. Wer von der militärischen Sicherung it was as the fiery leader of the young Social Democrats that Gerhard Schroeder first came to public notice. With a diatribe against militarism, the young politician had already left his mark. Gerhard Schroeder was born into poverty, his mother a war widow who worked as a cleaner. It was clear he felt destined for greater things. Mr. Schroeder played on his image as a family man, the working class boy made good. An MP by 1980, his next ambition was to lead his northern German state. By 1984, he was already with his third wife, Hilu, a marriage that was to last 12 years. Davon 79 ja In 1990, Gerhard Schroeder proved he was a winner, becoming one of Germany's powerful regional premiers. His earlier radicalism was replaced by a pragmatic, business-friendly approach. But it took his resounding win in Lower Saxony this March for the Social Democrats finally to accept him as their candidate for the chancellorship. Celebrating victory in his home state with his fourth and much younger wife, Doris, he proved that a chequered marital career was no bar to political advancement. He's met the Prime Minister on several occasions and has even been dubbed the German Tony Blair. Mr. Schroeder is expected to strengthen ties with Britain. But German business says there's one key difference between the two men. Tony Blair was able to get the party behind his economic program before he was elected. I think there's little chance for Mr. Schröder to get his party behind him after he's elected. <laughs> but today, nothing could detract from Gerhard Schröder's joy at the thought of leading Germany into the new millennium. Caroline Wyatt, BBC News, Bonn. And Caroline Wyatt joins us now from Bonn. Caroline, Mr. Schroeder needs to form a coalition to govern. Is that a virtual formality? No, this could be his hardest task of all. It's a bit like a marriage. You have to find the right partner, discuss the issues, and make sure that the partnership will work. And in Mr. Schroeder's case, it could be that a weakened Conservative Party will be more to his taste. He could wield more power there uh, with their pragmatic kind of policies than he would with the more radical Greens, who are far, far to the left of Mr. Schroeder. And what will be the principal feature of the new government that distinguishes it from the old? I think it will be a far more inward-looking government. Tonight, Mr. Schroeder actually said his first priority will be combating record unemployment. It will be a government more concerned with domestic policy. He is not of the same generation as Helmut Kohl. He will not be the same kind of driving force within Europe towards ever greater union or towards more federalism. In fact, he's even slightly sceptical about the European single currency. And above all, I think he wants to draw Britain into the relationship with Germany and France. 
forming part of a triangle, if you like, over the coming years. Caroline Wyatt in Bonn, thank you. Here, Tony Blair has praised the new Chancellor as a man of tremendous ability. He said he and Gerhard Schroeder shared the same perspective and he was looking forward to working with him. But Mr Blair himself has suffered a setback at the start of Labour's party conference in Blackpool. Four left-wingers have won seats on the party's ruling national executive. Among them is Liz Davis, who was barred by Labour from standing as an MP because of her record as a local councillor. Outside the hall, two demonstrations underlined the growing pressures of government. The far-left Socialist Workers' Party were protesting about public sector pay restrictions, while farmers aired their grievances about collapsing farm gate prices. Inside, in an embarrassing setback for the leadership, only two Blairites won places on the constituency section of the party's national executive, while four went to the left-wing grassroots alliance. Their successes included Liz Davis, banned as a candidate at the last election. We've had four members of the Grassroots Alliance elected onto the NEC, and given the odds, given that we were, as I say, massively out, massively outspent, we were smeared by, by, by senior party officials in the media. It shows that party members don't care about the smears, what they care about, the politics that we stood for. Some sought to shrug off the setback. Party spoken, good results. Others issued a warning to the newcomers. If they are intending to use the NEC as a means of undermining the party leadership, then that's not, not what members want. Mr Blair tackled worries the new style party conference would stifle debate by conducting a no-holds-barred question session. He warned those who spread disillusion wouldn't get a left-wing Labour government, but a right-wing Tory one and he met party fears he might gallop into a deal with the Lib Dems on a new voting system by pledging to proceed with care. The time for decision on it is not now, and I can assure you of one thing, there will be no decision taken on this unless the party is fully and completely involved. It is far too important a decision to be done any other way. Mr Blair's damping down hopes of an early referendum after the Jenkins report on proportional representation. But there's trouble ahead. Foreign Secretary Robin Cook warned tonight they shouldn't slam the door on a report they hadn't seen. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Blackpool. West Midlands police have arrested a man in connection with the death of an 80-year-old Roman Catholic priest. Father Paul Orchard failed to appear to celebrate Mass this morning at his church in Brandhall. His body was discovered at the presbytery where he lived alone. More than a million people have left their homes in the southern United States as the region braces itself for Hurricane George. A storm with winds of more than 100 miles an hour has claimed more than 300 lives and left a trail of devastation across the Caribbean and the Florida Keys. Sport and Finland's Mika Hakkinen has won the Luxembourg Grand Prix ahead of Michael Schumacher, who was second. Hakkinen squeezed in front of Schumacher when he came out of the pit lane following his first pit stop. He kept the lead all the way to the finish and has a four-point advantage going into the championship's final race. Britain's tennis players are back among the world elite for the first time in six years. Tim Henman's straight sets win gave Britain an unbeatable 3-1 lead over India in their Davis Cup tie. After years in the doldrums for British tennis, it was perhaps appropriate the country's number one, Tim Henman, the focal point of the sport in recent years, had the opportunity to lead Britain back into the world's top tennis nations. Having taken the first set on a tie-break, he sailed through the second six games to two. The match really came to life, though, in the third set. Again going to a tie-break, Henman this time showing the fighting qualities that have made him one of the world's top players. After two hours on court, the moment British tennis fans have been waiting six years for. Henman leading the way to confirm Britain's re-emergence in the sport. Bernie Rose, BBC News. And the main news tonight, it's the end of an era in Germany, with the defeat after 16 years in power of Helmut Kohl. And that's all from the BBC Newsroom tonight. <laughs>